All right, hi everyone, it's that time again. There's a new Blender release, version 3.1. So as usual, we're gonna take a look through the release page and just talk about the new features. Before we get into it, I will say that Southern Shotty has created a really lovely video on the official Blender channel, providing a very quick breakdown of all the new stuff with some nice visual demonstrations. But with every new release, they make a lovely web page with all these nice graphics and like comparison charts and GIFs and stuff like that. So I like having a look through these when I do my videos. So yeah, let's get into it. So from the looks of it, Blender 3.1 is mostly focused around performance improvements and geometry nodes, but of course there are new features in other departments. Let's take a look down the page here. Pedal to the metal. So Cycles now supports the metal GPU backend, which is good news for Apple users. So we have a nice comparison chart here of the number of samples calculated per minute on an Apple M1 Max processor. You can see here that the M1 CPU is comparatively much slower than the M1 GPU, so metal basically. So this is good news for Apple users who quite often get left behind in the software department. But there are a couple of caveats you can see here currently supporting on Apple M1 computers running Mac OS 12.2 or newer, and Apple computers with AMD graphics cards on Mac OS 12.3 or newer. I don't actually know what portion of the Blender community uses Apple when compared to other systems, but that'd be interesting to find out. So the next section here, make a point. This is all about point clouds. The new point cloud object can be rendered directly with cycles to create sand, water splashes, particles, or even motion graphics. This is a really interesting one. My friend Ben, BBBN19, showed me this recently. And basically you can render millions of like perfect spheres and cycles. They can have materials and everything and use them to create all kinds of interesting effects. Now, when we think about point clouds, we think about photogrammetry and representing real life scenes, but it's definitely not limited to that. If I actually scroll down here and click on see all cycles changes, we can take a look at a couple of demonstrations. So here you can see a sand demonstration. We've got a truck which is just dumping sand on the ground. This is all done with the point clouds. And this is a really cool mandel bulb demonstration by Michael Prostka. So just to quickly read from the wiki here, direct rendering of point cloud objects as spheres is now supported. This is much more efficient in memory usage and render time compared to instancing an object in every point. Yeah, apparently it's much faster. So even if you had like the simplest piece of geometry you could make, like an icosphere with just a few faces, and instance that millions of times to make a point cloud, apparently it would still be much, much slower than the new point cloud system, which generates these perfect spheres. So this is really, really cool. The new point info shader node can also be used to get the point center position and radius, as well as a random value for the point. So yeah, you can generate materials for these as well and used a random value of the point info node to assign like different colors to the point clouds or do all sorts of other stuff like that. So what else? More cycles. There's been a lot of work with cycles apparently. So ray tracing precision has been improved. They say this helps with rendering things at different scales. So many artifacts from rendering small, large and faraway objects have been eliminated. There will always be object scales where numerical precision becomes a problem, but it's further out now. But the trade-off of this ray tracing precision is that there will still be artifacts when rendering overlapping geometry. In some cases it's more severe than before. Such overlapping geometry should be removed or have small distance added in between. So overlapping geometry has always been a bit of a bad practice to use. So that's not too much of a concern, but I imagine that maybe there's a few non-realistic rendering artists that might rely on overlapping geometry for some like specific visuals, but you know, even just an insignificant amount of distance between the two surfaces should be enough to make it better. So there's lots of other stuff here for you rendering nerds. Um, you can click on any one of these and learn more about it. So here we go, by clicking on the optics temporal denoising support, we can get the commit for these and have a look through if you're interested in all the details. So going back, build anything. Blender's ever-growing procedural system gets 19 new nodes, including mesh modeling tools, Tools, access to time, advanced field control, incredible performance improvements, fewer unnecessary updates, and much more. So this is basically where the geometry nodes focus comes in. So there's lots of kind of quality of life stuff here, but again, most of the efforts on increasing the performance of the system. But also, as I've mentioned in previous videos, uh, the new nodes that have been added with this are going to massively help with doing parametric modeling and procedural design for modeling objects. So that'd be really interesting to play with when I do more of my generative modeling experiments. So one really cool thing here is drag drop search. So speed up your workflow by dragging dragging sockets to get a list of automatically filtered nodes. So basically, as you can see, if you drag out the geometry, you can get like all the possible options that geometry can plug into in terms of nodes, and then you can add it there. So it's basically like having a smart search system where depending on what type of socket you're pulling out, it will give you recommendations for the nodes which you can use. I've seen add-ons do this before, but it hasn't been in Blender until now. It works on both input and output sockets, and it's available in the geometry, shading, and the compositor nodes. So that's fantastic. All right, instance attributes. This is more of a technical one that you'd only really be concerned about if you've been playing with geometry nodes a fair bit. Instances can now also have their own dynamic attributes this fully elevates them to be their own domain now and enables a powerful workflow by completing the pipeline where realized meshes can inherit data from instances that inherit data from points that inherit data from instances you get the picture 
So now we come down to more features and this is a massive one here, node group assets. I'm not sure why this is a small one here. This should have like its own big section. You can now mark node groups as assets, drag and drop them from the asset browser into the shading, geometry nodes, or the compositor. So you can see here in this little GIF here where there's a chocolate bar node group, which can now be dragged into the node editor. That's fantastic. I think that now means that I can put my node group tools into an asset library. So I might have to make a note actually, now that I'm thinking about it to go and do that for people. So again, for like product developers and people that are making node group packs and material packs, this is something to keep in mind. Okay, so next is timings overlay. So if you're really interested in making efficient geometry nodes trees, or you want to know where your performance bottlenecks are, then this is going to be useful. You can see at a glance how fast your nodes, including node groups, are performing. So it'll give you the measurement in milliseconds there. And also volume grids, the spreadsheet now lists volume grids info such as grid names, data types, and class. Okay, so now we get to the more mesh manipulation type nodes. So these are going to be the interesting ones for generative modeling. New kids on the building blocks. Woohoo! Extrude mesh, scale elements, stretch map using filter index, and accumulate field. Let's take a look at these. So the extrude mesh is, I guess, self explanatory. You're just extruding meshes. The long awaited extrude node finally made it into Blender. Now a whole different approach to procedural modeling is possible. In this example, a procedural chocolate bar is achieved with multiple steps of simply extruding and scaling. Of course, on this page as well, whenever they provide demonstrations, you can download the Blend file to take a look for yourself. Just as a side note, I really appreciate the effort they put into these pages. It's hard to believe that Blender is completely free when you see the amount of quality that's put into stuff like this. Anyway, let's take a look. So the extrude mesh, you can see the nodes here. It's being extruded, so we can see that it's extruding the entire mesh to start with. And then you can see the individual tick boxes ticked here, which means it's going to extrude the individual faces, which is how you get that extra effect. Then it's scaling the elements down, so by 0.75. So that's taking those faces and then bringing them inwards. And then it's extruding those downwards and then doing a final scale. So because this is all procedural, it means that whatever your base object is, your base mesh, it's going to perform that entire operation on that. So I think they provide a demonstration of that here, whereas they're adding extra loop cuts there. It's creating this weird procedural chocolate bar effect. So you can imagine how this going to have like loads of new applications. Okay, so scale elements is what we had a look at there as well. So you can use that to scale different selections of mesh content. Again, keep an eye on these selection nodes here. This is where the real power comes in because you can select specific parts of the mesh to manipulate. The scale elements node goes hand in hand with the extrude node. Connected elements of a selection can be scaled around the individual center. So combined with extruding the individual faces and using the top faces as a selection creates the effect you can see right here. Now, obviously a chocolate bar demo is quite simple, but I guess it's just a proof of concept. So stretch map using filter index. This one's a bit more complex. The filter index node makes it possible to read out the value of an evaluated field at a different index. That's this one here. This little node is a building block that is important to make all sorts of custom operations possible where elements need to exchange data. Here it's used to generate a directional stretch map based on the UV space. So you can see here from the edge vertices we're taking vertex index 1, we're getting the UV field there, and then we're modifying the UV by subtracting the vector at a different vertex index. So that's basically what's giving us the squash effect. Okay, not really beginner stuff, but still very important for doing complex operations. The next one's the accumulate field. This one's going to be more important for structural geometry nodes trees. So you can see here, the accumulate field node lets you dynamically add up values of a field within a group. Here you can see this used to stack cubes by figuring out the cumulative height of the previous cubes for each cube in the stack. So here we have the stack index coming into the accumulate field node and a random height's being generated. And that gives us the trailing Z offset height there. Again, kind of not really beginner, but an important node for getting complex structural node trees. But anyway, they have a section here where they display more of the new nodes. And if you want to learn more about these, one thing I really like again about this web page is you can click on any one of them and it will take you to the wiki page here where you can read a description of how they work and the inputs and outputs as well. So again, for example, if we click on the merge by distance node, here we can see how it works. And also there's an example image here where you can see how to merge the points by a given distance. And there's a nice image demonstration. So let's scroll down and I'll hide that so I don't make anyone dizzy. Nodes so far, Splendor 3.1 brings performance in geometry nodes to the next level. Many nodes are now multi threaded and use less memory. So again, the emphasis on performance. It'll be a bit boring for me to read through all of these, so you can just have a quick look at them here. I guess a couple of the important ones are Realize Instances node is now multi-threaded. That's super important. Improvements to multi-threading with medium loads up to 10 times, up to 20% improvement in memory use, two to three times speed up processing single values, etc, etc. So a lot of efficiency optimizations here. And more, 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 more node stuff. See all the node editor changes here if you like. Scroll through the entire page. Have a good read through if you want to do your homework. Okay, back to slightly more interesting stuff, vertex creasing. It's now possible to mark individual vertices as arbitrarily sharp to create interesting shapes more efficiently. So now it's not just edge creasing, we have vertex creasing. Support for Pixar open subdiv for modeling, rendering, Alembic, and USD import export. 
Right, so for you animators out there, Copy Global Transform. The built-in Copy Global Transform add-on makes it possible to copy the world space transform of the active object or bone and paste it into any other object or bone. This isn't really specific for animators, I think this is a useful tool to have. I'm not really sure why it's an add-on, I think that'd be like a pretty cool feature just to have in Blender anyway, but it's useful, it's there, you can use it if you like. You can also read more again and have a little look for its own wiki page. All right, let's come on down and have a look at the other features. Got some really nice artwork here. I like how there are two different versions of the artwork as we scroll down from the day to the night version. That's very pretty. Anyway, so Grease Pencil. So the fill tool for Grease Pencil now allows for dilation and contraction. So you can basically have an inset of space when you're filling in your shapes. Also, there's the shrink wrap modifier. So if you're drawing grease pencil objects, you can have them wrap around an object, which would be interesting for doing all kinds of like stylized details. Actually, maybe not even stylized because you can compare grease pencil strokes to meshes. So you could probably draw on like all kinds of weird greebling effects on meshes as well and have them kind of like wrap around to the shape. Anyway, that's just an idea. Line up backface culling, export, scene, frame range, and PDF export, merge all layers option in the merge operator, randomized parametering layer modifier, etc, etc. Lots of really cool stuff. See all grease pencil updates. Got a lovely page with some extra images. Okay, so this is another big one, Subdivide and Conquer. The Subdivision Surface Modifier has now had a huge, huge, huge performance improvement because it's now GPU accelerated. Well, you need to have a compatible GPU, but yes, it's GPU accelerated. So you can see here, lagging, lagging, tick the GPU, and haha, all very smooth. With a lovely performance comparison graph here, so Subdiv level 1, 2, and 3, using the CPU and then the GPU, and so I think that's a huge one. Very, very happy to see that. But that's not all in the performance department. Performance in and out, faster.obj. Exporting OBJ files is now orders of magnitude faster thanks to porting it to C++. Wait, what was it before then? Oh, the last one was just with Python. Okay, interesting. So yeah, exporting is a hell of a lot faster again. More of a comparison chart here if you want to take a look. And also faster FBX. A massive improvement can be seen on files with armatures in rest position. And when they say massive, they're really not lying. Jeez, check that out. Why was it so long beforehand then? Lots of questions. I guess it doesn't matter anymore. All performance improvements are very welcome. Oh yeah, here's another thing. Go big. So the image editor can now handle much larger images for preview and for editing. So this video shows a 52K image repeated indefinitely. Oh wow, I see. I didn't actually know you could actually repeat them. So it's a 52K image and look at that. The performance maintains. So that's pretty cool. Even more speed, asset browser library index loading, faster edit mode toggle, that's really good. Performance improvement on mesh vertex and face normals, all right. So Blender 3.1 is fast, but how fast does it run on your computer? You can download and run the Blender benchmark to share and compare your score with openly accessible benchmarks provided by the Blender community. So if you want to give that a try, you can click on that button there. But wait, there's more. Of course there's more. There's always more. They have such a long list of improvements. Okay, let's have a quick look through this and see if there's any important ones to stand out. Python 3.10, I guess. Open file browser and thumbnail view when browsing fonts. New color space conversion node and compositor. That's actually pretty important. Rigify improvements. Floating point font size is in the UI, that's convenient. Scene time node in Compositor. Oh yeah, that's a really interesting one, but we'll probably end up talking about this in some future tutorials. Basically allows you to consider the time of like the timeline inside of node trees. Python API additions and changes. Oh no, I'm going to have to read up on this and see if it's broken all of my add-ons. Side note, if some of my tools don't work with Blender 3.1, give me a little bit of time to figure it out and fix it. Also, please let me know so I can get ahead of it. Equalize handles in the graph editor. Fix tearing artifacts in the image editor. That's good. Auto close brackets and quotes in the text editor. Huh. Oh, it's quite nice. Control the opacity of wireframe bones. We know about some of the rest of these. Okay, that's lovely. And again, you can also get the artwork for the splash screen by downloading the blend file here. That'll take us to the Blender Studio webpage, I believe. And also all of the previous artworks for the other splash screens are available as well. So you can go back and click on them. This one's by Arendale. And yeah, I just love how open and accessible everything is. So hopefully that gives you an idea for some of the stuff that's available to play with in Blender 3.1. Again, like I said, there's a really lovely video on the official Blender channel made by Southern Shotty, kind of breaking these things down and giving more of a visual demonstration. But now it looks like on top of already having a lot of work to do, I've got a lot of new stuff to play with. So, oh boy, that's going to be intense. I mean, being busy is a good problem to have, right? Anyway, I guess that's where we'll leave it for this video. If you made it this far, the emoji for this video is going to be the fire emoji, because forgive me for saying it, this release is pretty lit. Feel free to check out some of the other content I make. I've got all kinds of add-ons and resources available on curtisholder.online forward slash store. I recommend checking out the Generators Lab content pack for Bygen and the Modular Metals Procedural Materials pack. There's been some pretty cool community creations using these recently, so feel free to check them out. If you like my work, you can also support me on Patreon. Maybe follow me on social media, join our Discord server as well to share your work and take part in discussions. But otherwise, you know, just have a fantastic day and enjoy playing with Blender 3.1. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.